What makes sense, I think, is that in our busy lives, if we take time to simply stop and sit down, we are likely to notice less stress, simply because we're not running around as much doing our usual busy activities. But of course, as one finds out very quickly at the beginning of meditation practice, even though the body has slowed down, we then get a chance to see what the mind is doing, and it takes quite a bit of practice to train the mind so that it slows down and gains the ability to focus on one object. That object might be the breath or whatever object is chosen. So, in spite of the promises of all that meditation can do for you, we want to be aware that you don't bring your serious illness to the meditation cushion looking for cures. But, what we can accomplish, and what comes from the original teachings, is this sense of calm, and over time, inner peace. And this all becomes developed in three areas. And these are the three areas that the Buddha taught. The first is, as we were just practicing, called samatha, which means approximately um, calm abiding or calm resting. And it's not resting in a place, it is a state of calm where body and mind begin to slow down and things feel more settled and calm. Out of that, over time, if we practice, develops the second part of this path, which is called in Pali, Pana, or in Sanskrit, Prajna, which means wisdom. A state of enlightenment begins to develop. We begin to see things as they really are, which is how the Buddhists define wisdom, to see things as they really are. The third part of the practice is the part that you're not likely to see in any ads in the newspapers or in magazines, because the third part is about developing what is called sila, S-I-L-A. And that refers to one's ethical behavior, or morality, or simply how we live our lives, how we are in the world. And of course, if one were to advertise that, not many people would respond, because we would all say, well, I'm a very moral person, I live my life very cleanly, etc. But the Buddhist teachings ask us to look more deeply at this. And for those of us who are not monks and nuns, specifically we're asked to look at five precepts, or sometimes translated as five mindfulness trainings. They're very basic and they're very direct, but notice that they're not offered as thou shalt, or rules and regulations or commandments, although if you were in a monastic community, if you were a monk or a nun, there would be rules in the monastic community and you would follow those rules because you were in training for a particular way of life. In our way of life, lay people, householders, these five trainings offer us a way of life that offer protection for ourselves and for those around us, offer us a way to be in the world. If you like Ken Wilber's vernacular, a way to be in the world without being of the world. Very simply stated, those five precepts are don't kill, don't steal, don't engage in sexual misconduct, don't lie, and don't use intoxicants that can cloud your mind. Because obviously that defeats 
the goal of trying to see things as they really are. Now, many commentators th down through the centuries and contemporary teachers and commentators expand these precepts so that we can see them as mindfulness trainings and also so that we see these teachings in our everyday lives. So one of my favorite translations and approaches to these trainings um, were offered by my first teacher, the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh, who translates these as mindfulness trainings, and he begins each one of them by saying, aware of the suffering caused by and the first would be, of course, aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life. And we know, of course, if there is the loss of a life, the loss of a loved one, there is destruction. I, I'm sorry, there is suffering, there is grief. I don't think there are any of us who have not experienced that. And the Buddha taught that all living beings want to live. Therefore, honor that and extend that, expand that, that mindful awareness to not destroying any life. So, the way Thich Nhat Hanh states this, first he says, aware of the suffering caused by the destruction of life, and then the second part of each of these trainings, he says, I am determined, I am aware of, and now I am determined, in this case, not to kill, to prevent others from killing, and not to support any act of killing. So again, just to increase our awareness. Now one thing that we know and that we have to accept is that we will not perfect these practices. First of all, essentially we cannot. If we drive our car in the summertime, notice the windshield. We are killing little creatures. When we boil water for our tea, we're killing little microorganisms. When we walk on a beautiful day like today in the park, and, and we walk in the park, we're stepping on living creatures. So this is not about perfection, but it is about awareness. Aware of where I'm stepping. And if I am driving my car, aware of what is happening. Not to feel guilty, but just to be aware of the space that I take in this world and my imprint in this world. So the second mindfulness training again begins with aware of the suffering caused by exploitation, social injustice, and stealing. Taking anything that is not ours. Paper clips, rubber bands in the office, that multi-billion dollar corporation that underpays you. Aware of the suffering caused by stealing, I am determined not to steal and not to possess anything that should belong to others. It's pretty straightforward. Notice that when we speak about not killing, we, we don't make the exception of saying, well, I won't kill except when someone's really annoying me. And what about, for us New York City apartment dwellers, those little creatures that occasionally crawl across the kitchen counter? How do we deal with those? Is there a way to set up our apartment and buy products that will prevent these creatures from entering the apartment so that we're not faced with making a difficult decision? These are all ways of exploring. Sharon Salzberg and Joseph Goldstein tell a story about Years and years ago, when they first began teaching retreats, they went to a retreat center and they found those long strips of fly, sticky paper, 
filled with flies that had been stuck on them. And they said, we're not going to teach here. You put in screens in the windows because that's the mindful thing to do, that's the compassionate thing to do. That's what these teachings are about. To become more mindful so that compassion and wisdom arise. Third mindfulness training, aware of the suffering caused by sexual misconduct. Now, sexual misconduct is a cultural and social situation. Sexual misconduct is different in different cultures. So this, as with all of these trainings, come upon us to make decisions. But to help that, I am determined to respect my commitments and the commitments of others. That's pretty clear cut. If I've made a commitment and given my word and I step outside of that, we can define that as sexual misconduct. Thich Nhat Hanh says, enter into relationships with a loving sense and intention that this be a long-term relationship. One time when I was on retreat with Thai, someone said, how do we define long-term? Does it have to be more than an hour? <laughs> and as always, the Buddhist teachings end up in your hands. The, the Buddha says, only this is what I've learned from my experience. It's, it's not filled with do's and don'ts. Become more aware. Become more aware of the person you want to be. Because if your actions have regrets after them, they're going to show up in your meditation practice and it can become unpleasant. Fourth mindfulness training. Aware of the suffering caused by unmindful speech. Now this, of course, the core is to speak the truth, to not lie. Um, I am determined to speak truthfully. There are many tributaries of this, to speak in a way that is supportive, uplifting, to not mislead, to not fib, to not deceive, to use our words, which have tremendous power, to be a benefit to ourselves and to other beings, and to realize the destructive potential of words. I would venture to say that all of us can remember words that were spoken to us when we were very young and still have a certain sting about them. That's the power of words. Fifth mindfulness training aware of the suffering caused by unmindful consumption. Now here we're speaking about alcohol, drugs. In Thich Nhat Hanh's community, there is no alcohol. In other tracts of Buddhist teachings, the teaching is to be mindful of your consumption. If you are fine with a glass of wine, again, it's in your hands. I suppose it's in your mouth, actually. <laughs> but be mindful, be aware that this begins to affect the, way, the clarity of the mind. So, I am determined not to abuse alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants. Again, remember that in some communities that would say not to use alcohol, I'm reading this as not to abuse alcohol. Drugs. What about other ways in which toxins enter the body? What books do we read? What television programs do we watch? What magazines do we look at? What films do we go to see? All of this comes into the body and into the mind. So this teaching says, be aware of what is toxic and what enters the mind and body. 